September 1976. Dr. Herbert Hopkins encounters a man dressed in a black suit, hat, tie, and shoes with a white shirt. He had no hair, eyebrows, or eyelashes with dead white skin and red lips. Hopkins was investigating the case of David Stevens, who claimed that one year earlier he saw a UFO as big as a football field before experiencing hours of missing time. Hypnotic regression later revealed Stevens believed he was taken on board a craft with four and a half foot beings who took blood and hair samples. Hopkins had tapes of these sessions, but after a visit from the man in black, he says he was forced to destroy them. He then told me, or rather I should say he stated, that I had tape recordings on the Stevens case, on the hypnosis and on the details and so forth. And uh, I was a little bit frightened. He ordered me to destroy the tapes and any other correspondence. And indeed, anything I had in writing or otherwise that had anything to do with UFOs, even not if not connected with this case at all, anything, get rid of it. Not the least bit indignant, not the least bit angry. He just said, do it. He said that uh, he would know when I had done so. And also, <clears throat> he did leave a threat. If I didn't do so, I would suffer the same fate as Bonnie Hill. He did not say he would come back or anything, he just, but he did say that he would know when I had done that. It was put in an inhuman machine way, if you see what I mean. You know, if I can get this across. We're a new channel covering declassified files. Subscribe to join us. He was hardly the first UFO researcher intimidated by mysterious men in black. By the 1960s, it was happening so frequently that a lieutenant general in the U.S. Air Force wrote this memo on impersonations of Air Force officers. It was sent to the Army and even officers who manage U.S. nuclear assets. It read, Information has reached HQ USAF that persons claiming to represent the Air Force or other defense establishments have contacted citizens who have sighted unidentified flying objects. In one reported case, an individual in civilian clothes who represented himself as NORAD demanded and received photos belonging to a private citizen. In another, a person in an Air Force uniform approached local police and other citizens who had sighted a UFO, assembled them in a schoolroom, and told them they did not see what they thought they saw. Project Blue Book took notice. The same year, its spokesman told John Keel UFO witnesses were being silenced by intimidating men dressed in fake military uniforms. He told Keel Blue Book checked with Jersey area Air Force bases after witnesses of a UFO over the Wanake Reservoir were told by a man not to discuss what they saw. Whoever it was, he wasn't from the Air Force. NORAD said something similar. Its chief of staff revealed it had no connection to a man who showed up on the doorstep of Rex Heflin. He took photos of a flying disc Heflin had in his possession, claiming he worked with the group. Keel summed up what he thought was going on in a memo. Our extensive research indicates a large, well-equipped, and well-financed organization has been carrying out a carefully planned program of harassment and interference for at least 20 years. The purposes of this program are to suppress investigation into the UFO mystery, discredit the individuals who are involved in such investigations, instill fear and confusion in witnesses. Heflin, whose photos were seized, experienced this more than once. On August 3, 1965, the 38-year-old was driving on the boundary of Orange County in Southern California, a half mile away from the El Toro Marine Base. He was a highway maintenance engineer. Part of his job was to report traffic signs that were not clearly visible. Because of this, he carried a Polaroid camera loaded with film. Around noon, Heflin noticed a railroad crossing sign covered by tree branches and attempted to report the sign to his boss, but his radio suddenly failed. 
It's at this point when he saw a flash on his left. He saw a silvery craft flying slowly from left to right. It was an eighth mile away, about 150 feet off the ground. He snapped this photo. After it crossed the road, it began to wobble similar to a gyroscope when losing its stability, he later said. His second photo shows a dark underside. He said it had a rotating beam of light beneath it. An enhanced version of the original corroborates this. As it moved further away, it began to tilt toward him and rapidly disappeared into the distance, leaving a ring of blue-black smoke. His final photo shows this ring. Over the next few days, he shared these with coworkers and family. The owners of the nearby Santa Ana Register got wind of them and asked Heflin if he could run a story on the sighting. Heflin agreed and sought no payment. In fact, he never copyrighted the photos or ever made any money from them. The day the story was published, a man claiming to be from NORAD called Heflin. He wanted to arrange a meeting. He told him not to speak with the press about the UFO any further. Two days later, on a late September evening, two men dressed in civilian clothes showed up at his door. They showed him a salmon and green ID card with no photo. They were there for the original Polaroids. Thinking they'd be returned, Heflin obliged. Two years passed. On October 11th, 1967, a man in a USAF uniform showed up on his doorstep. Like the others, he had a salmon and green ID card. Outside his house near the curb was something strange. Heflin saw a 65 or 66 dark blue Chevy with dark lettering on the door. He couldn't read it. He noticed the shape of a second man in the back seat emitting a strange purple glow. It's at this point when the stereo in his house began emitting a series of crackles and pops. The man in the Air Force uniform told him he investigated many UFO cases, including one in the Bermuda Triangle. He soon left and did not return the original photos. Decades passed. Heflin eventually retired after developing a rare medical condition, accumulation of lead in his bone marrow. It's thought this came from his daily exposure to traffic pollution. Having difficulty breathing, he moved to a small town in Northern California with better air quality. One afternoon in 1993, his phone rang. A woman's voice asked, have you checked your mailbox lately? The call ended. He checked and nothing was there. 30 minutes later, the same woman called. Have you checked your mailbox lately? He looked a second time. In it was a plain manila envelope. It had no postage marks. He opened the envelope and to his surprise, the original three Polaroids he gave up 30 years earlier were there. They had some additional markings. Each had the word original printed across the top using a white grease pencil. And each had the number 13 written on the back with a black pencil. Heflin did not create these markings. Whoever or whatever took them that day in 1965, appears to have. For what purpose? We don't know. But Heflin's story and Dr. Hopkins' encounter are just a couple examples of its efforts to seemingly suppress civilian investigation into UFO sightings. Let us know in the comments if you've ever had an MIB encounter. And once again, we want to give a special thank you to our Patreon supporters. Without you, this would not be possible. If you enjoy our channel and want to support our production of one episode a week, join us on Patreon. It really helps us out. You can also support our channel by making sure you're subscribed, hitting the notification bell, and sharing with others who may enjoy this content. Thank you again, and see you next time.